What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, James Murphy, a.k.a. Murph, and today is a epic, epic day here in Boston sports because we have the Boston Red Sox entering the ALCS with Game 1 tonight down in Houston. Don in Houston is going to be a fantastic series. It's going to be an incredible, incredible game, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait for this series to kick off. But in addition to that, we have NFL stuff to go over. We have Patriots stuff to go over as we take a look ahead at the Patriots versus Cowboys week six matchup in Foxborough. Big game all around. Cowboys need to try to make a statement that they're the best team in the NFC. Meanwhile, the Patriots are trying to reel back into the AFC picture, the AFC East divisional picture for for that sake and then also we're going to go over and predict the scores like we do every single Friday episode but to kick off today's episode I do want to talk about big 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 massive Bruins news but before I get to that I have to always ask how is we how blah, blah, blah. <laughs> how was your week I'm talking too fast how was your week this week beautiful weather absolutely felt like a little bit of summer was still in the air, but honestly, at the end of the day, it's just great fall weather. Like right now, what it is, it's like warm for a few hours during the day, a little chilly in the morning, a little chilly at night. It's perfect weather. Yeah, well, maybe not to me perfect because you know me. I like the 95 death heat for some reason. I'm weird like that. But a lot of people, it's perfect weather right now outside, and I will not complain because it's not freezing cold yet, and when it gets freezing cold, then I'll be upset. But moreover, hopefully you had a great week and you have a fantastic weekend ahead of you. Like I said, Red Sox baseball, ALCS game one tonight, game two tomorrow night. Then you have Patriots Cowboys on Sunday. So it's going to be a nuttacular weekend in Boston sports. Oh, by the way, the Bruins open up Saturday. They open up tomorrow against the Dallas Stars, and that's going to segue into my Bruins topic, that big, big news that I want to talk about, and that's Bruins and Charlie McAvoy agree to an eight-year, $76 million extension, 76 divided by eight, 9.5 years, uh, million, duh, $9.5 million over eight years insane deal I expected this deal to be honest I didn't expect it to be 9.5 I was thinking more 8 8.5 9.5 wow that is absolutely astronomical but listen this 23 year old kid Charlie McAvoy is the anchor to our defense now he is a staple to our team identity he is a leader in the clubhouse he is one of the best defensive players in the National Hockey League. He's one of the best offensive defensemen in the National Hockey League. And honestly, I think this contract's going to be worth it. 9.5, like I said, I thought that was a little expensive, a little pricey. But listen, if you're half a million off from getting this deal done, just give him the extra half a million per year and let's just call it a damn day. Because you do not want to run the risk of losing a cornerstone, a franchise cornerstone piece like this to free agency and lose him for nothing because if he's not re-signed then it's like well some team's gonna want him for a playoff run then you're gonna want to trade him and get a couple pieces back so you don't lose him for nothing in free agency all while you're in your own playoff push because the Bruins are going to be competitive this year they will be in the playoff picture I I hope like to think that they'll be in the playoffs, period. But let's just go playoff picture because anything can happen in hockey over the course of an 82-game regular season. But this is absolutely a necessity. With David Krejci now gone, I do feel like Charlie McAvoy can be vaulted to an alternate captain. I don't know if alternate captains have been announced or released yet. Uh, let me... Bruins alternate captains 2021. Let's see if they've uh, released it yet. Hmm. I don't think so, but list of captains, alternate captains. Right now, it's just Brad Marchand, and it's saying since 2021, 20, 2020, 2021. Hmm, that's a lie. He's been an alternate captain for a few years now. Him and Krejci used to alternate together. 
but I guess he is the official alternate captain. Okay, it is what it is, whatever. And then the rotating alternates. I wonder who that is because it used to be Marshand and Krejci. Hmm. Would it be McAvoy and... Is, it, is this... Here we go. Is this a nice little... January that's from January seventh. Anyways, I can do this on my own time and then I can talk about it um, on Monday's episode or whatever. But here we go. During the preseason, defensive Charlie McAvoy, Brandon Carlo, and winger David Pasternak each wore the coveted A for a game on Friday. Boston Bruins head coach confirmed that he will indeed alternate between the young trio that has developed into leaders on and off the ice over the last three years. This is um, from BostonHockeyNow.com. Written six days ago by Jimmy Murphy. Hey, shout out Jim Murphy. What's good? What is good, my brother? Anyways, so yeah, so McAvoy, Carlo, and Pasternak will be rotating A's. Brad Marchand is a staple. He is a confirmed alternate captain, game in and game out. And then obviously Patrice Bergeron is your captain that you know and love. But yes, this Charlie McAvoy contract is huge. It's massive. It's large. It's expensive. But I do foresee the NHL salary cap going up very soon. Obviously, it's not going to take a massive jump, but it'll gradually go up as long as the league is making money, right? And with them, with the games for hockey being on ESPN now, it absolutely should go up. And so hopefully, hopefully this contract doesn't bite us in the ass. But listen, like I said, 23 years old, cornerstone fr uh, franchise player, one of the best defensive players in the National Hockey League, one of the best offensive defenseman in the National Hockey League. You can't go wrong. You do not want to lose this guy for a couple of draft picks or a couple of bums all while you're trying to compete for the Stanley Cup. Get the deal done. Move on to the next thing. I love the deal. I love the re-signing. I'm so happy he's going to be here for eight years. And then once Bergeron and Marchand kind of phase out a little bit once they retire, I could absolutely see this guy being the next Boston Bruins captain. I really do see that. I feel that. And if it was up to me right now, if we had no captain right now, I'd give it to him. That's just me. That's my humble opinion, but I definitely want to hear yours. That could be a little bit of a stretch, that whole captaincy thing. But you know what? We've seen young captains before. Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin. You've seen it before. It can happen. But anyways, let me know your thoughts, whether you're reaching out to me via social media at Murph's Car Town or down in the comment section below if you're watching this on YouTube. Let me know your thoughts about this Charlie McAvoy eight-year, $9.5 million per year, $76 million total contract extension that was announced this morning. I don't know what time. This article that I'm just kind of reading off of came out at 1019 this morning, so I'm assuming this contract got done probably late last night. But listen, I'm, I'm a happy guy. Listen, Bruin season's right around the corner. Game one of the regular season tomorrow night. I know I haven't talked too much about Bruins hockey. It's just been with the Red Sox in the playoffs, the Patriots, the way that they're going. It's been a little bit of a struggle, but trust me, I'm going to talk more about Bruins hockey. I'll talk about them on Monday. I promise you that. I do want to talk NFL first before we dive into Red Sox and their ALCS matchup against the Houston Astros. I have a lot of points I want to talk about. Pitching, the Astros, um, the Red Sox, obviously, how I could foresee this series playing out. I have a lot of topping, uh, talking points to get to. So I want to dive into, obviously, predicting the NFL scores for week six. I want to talk about the Patriots first and kind of get that nugget out of the way so we can spend as much time as we need to talk about Red Sox and the American League Championship Series. And I just paused the recording, actually, because I got a text from my... Uh, my best friend John, and he was saying Zach Ertz just got traded to the Arizona Cardinals. So I had to pause, look into it real quick, because I didn't want to try to do it on the fly here, because I wanted to make sure A, it was true, and I want to make sure I can talk about it. So really quickly, just 60 seconds, give me 60 seconds here. The Philadelphia Eagles are sending three-time Pro Bowl tight end Zach Ertz to the Arizona Cardinals in exchange for cornerback Tay Gowan in a 2022 fifth-round pick. Interesting development. Honestly, this is a good move by the Cardinals because it gives Kyler Murray another freaking weapon to deal with, right? You have uh, you have Kenyon Drake, you have James Conner, 
No, wait. Kenyon Drake's not there anymore. No, Chase Edmonds. Excuse me. You have Chase Edmonds, James Conner, DeAndre Hopkins, A.J. Green, Andy Isabella. Who's I forget the tight end there now. Now you have Zach Ertz. So And then obviously you have Kyler Murray, who's a weapon in of himself. This is a fantastic move. A fifth-round pick and a, and a cornerback. I don't even know who Tay Gowan is. No disrespect. But, I mean, this is a great move by the Arizona Cardinals, who are currently 5-0. and Let's be honest. And can I just jump to the schedule real quick? Who are they playing? Who are they playing? They're playing the Browns in Cleveland. So that's going to be a very good matchup right there. Very interested. I'll get into my prediction for that game in a few moments. But I like this move. Interesting move by Philadelphia because I feel like they could have got more. But Zach Ertz has kind of been on the decline as of late. I feel like ever since maybe like a year or two, I'd probably say like soon after the Super Bowl that the Eagles won over the Patriots. I feel like Zach Ertz has been kind of declining because Dallas Goddard has just been playing so good. And I know Zach Ertz has been kind of going through a few injuries, so I understand. But interesting move to kind of move on from Zach Ertz for the Philadelphia Eagles. I know he was a fan favorite there. People loved him in Philly. So it would be interesting to see how they're able to emotionally move on from this. But great move by the Arizona Cardinals. So that, that's all I want to talk about in terms of that trade for uh, the Arizona Cardinals and the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's dive into my week six predictions. So, listen, I can't talk about the Buccaneers-Eagles game. I can't give predictions, but I believe on Monday I said that they were going to win, and the Buccaneers did win 28-22. to Very interesting recording on Friday and be like, oh, yeah, let me predict all the scores across the league. Oh, but by the way, I can't predict one of them because it just happened last night. It's just LOL. So the first matchup, we have the Dolphins visiting the – well, I guess they're not technically visiting the Jaguars. It's the Dolphins versus the Jaguars in London. That game's at 930. So another London matchup for the NFL. It is between two Florida teams, the Dolphins and the Jaguars. You know, there's been some rumors that the Jaguars could move to London. I don't know what the hell their name would be. The Great Britain Jaguars. I feel like that's kind of – I feel like they would just have to completely change the name. Because, like, you know when teams bounce around, they'll sometimes keep their identity. So it's like – The San Diego Chargers, the Los Angeles Chargers, the St. Louis Rams, the Los Angeles Rams. They'll keep their identity, but like just the city name changes. Obviously, the Houston Oilers moved to Tennessee Titans because the owner just wanted something completely different. Totally fine. It is what it is. But, hmm, I don't know what a team name for the Jacksonville Jaguars would be in London. The London Silly (laughs) The London Silly Nannies. Anyways, Dolphins visiting... uh, I guess I'm saying that. I just see Dolphins. They're the away team, so I just assume that they're visiting. But Dolphins versus the Jaguars in London. I'm going to give this one to the Dolphins here. I just don't see any reason to pick the Jaguars. There's no momentum. There's no juice for this team right now, the Jaguars. Obviously, things could change. They're not going up against a great opponent. Or they are going. Yeah, they're not going up against a great opponent. Anything can really happen. It's a neutral site game. Obviously, that hinders the Jaguars because they don't have home field advantage. They don't have their fans. Then again, they don't have fans to begin with. So I'm going to give this edge to the Dolphins here. I like the Dolphins roster a lot better than I do the Jaguars. But if Trevor Lawrence was ever to have a game that says, I'm the first overall pick, go pound some sand. Obviously, I'm using choice words here. I think it would be this game, but I'm going to pick the Dolphins over the Jaguars in London, which that game kicks off at 930 Eastern time. Vikings visiting the Panthers. Panthers suffered a tough loss last week, but I still think the Panthers could come out of this game with a win. Vikings beat the Lions barely with a last second field goal. So I'm going to give this one to the Panthers because overall, I think they are a fairly good team. The Vikings, if they were to win, they would kind of crawl back into it just a little bit. But we'll see. We'll see. And before I go any further, by the way, this is week six. And earlier in the season, you know, on previous episodes, I've constantly said, wait till four, five, six weeks into the season. Wait till five, six weeks into the season where things kind of meticulate. Because these 2-0, and these 3-0 and teams, they could just be getting off hot. They could end up sizzling, being 2-4, and 3-3. and So this week is like that final week where it's like, all right, I think the good teams are going to kind of pronounce themselves and the bad teams are going to either stay bad or good teams that we thought were good are going to become bad or good teams that are playing bad are going to get good. So week six is a good little area right here that this is the last week to kind of 
feel the league out, right? I mean, people expected the Colts to be a potential playoff team, a potential uh, AFC South divisional winner. And they kind of suck, but they do suck. And, like, I feel like after six weeks, depending on their matchup against the Texans that I'll talk about in a few moments, we could actually see if they really do suck or if they just started off really cold. So, Chargers visiting the Ravens. This is going to be a good game. Thank goodness the Ravens aren't on prime time because I am sick of seeing them on primetime games. Anyways, I'm going to give this edge to the Chargers. I think the Chargers are blazing hot. Ravens, and all due respect, they are too. Lamar Jackson is playing out of his mind. I am starting to respect Lamar Jackson as a passer a little bit more, but I'm not fully there. I still need to see more consistency after week six. Obviously, that is my threshold. I just think Justin Herbert is about to become that guy in the NFL. This is going to be a great game. It could go either way. I won't be surprised if the Ravens win and the Chargers lose, but I'm predicting that the Chargers will win this game. Rams visiting the Giants in New York. Hydrate. Got to hydrate. Hold on. Got to, got to, got to hydrate. Rams visiting the Giants in the Meadowlands. Going to give this edge to the Rams. I just think the Rams are a much far superior team. Giants looked silly last week against the Cowboys. Could the Giants win this game in any way, shape, or form? I, I just going to depend on the defense. I just don't think that defense can keep up with the weaponry that the Los Angeles Rams have. So I'm going to give this one to the Rams, and I will be shocked if the Giants win this game, albeit it is in New York, well, New Jersey, technically. Texans visiting the Colts for AFC matchup, or AFC South matchup, excuse me. I know I just briefly talked about it. Texans played fairly well against the Patriots. They were so close to winning. Could I see the Texans win this game? Yes. Do I think they will? I don't know. I don't know. Colts. God, this one's tough because they both suck. They're both one and four. Um, ugh, I don't like this one. I want to lean Colts because they're the home team here. And if the Texans were the home team, I might lean Texans. But I think, ooh, Carson Wentz looked good too last week. Oh, this one's tough. I'm going to go Colts. I don't feel confident with it because I do like how the Texans are playing, albeit they have no superstars. Brandon Cooks is playing fairly well. Davis Mills is really popping off. But I think overall the Colts just have a much better roster, and I think 1-4 and four is a little bit deceiving for the talent that the Colts have on their team. So I'm going to go Colts. I won't be surprised if they lose, and I won't be surprised if the Texans win. But I'm going to pre- I'm going to be predicting the Indianapolis Colts in this game. If the Texans were home, I might lean Texans, to be honest. But we'll never know. Chiefs visiting the Washington football team. That game could have been very socially insensitive. It could have been. If you guys know what I'm talking about. And maybe five years from now, it'll be the Kansas City football team versus the Washington football team. Who knows? Who knows? Whatever. It doesn't matter. Chiefs visiting the football team in D.C. Washington's been a real disappointment this year. They're reeling at 2-3 and three right now. So aren't the Chiefs for that matter. If the football team wants to get back into this NFC East picture, they need to win this game because if they go 2-4 and four and the Cowboys beat the Patriots, forget about it. Chiefs 2-3, and three, obviously if they lose and the Chargers win, I'm not going to say forget about it because I still think the Chiefs can ring off 10 wins in a row if they want to. Um, maybe they don't have that kind of power anymore in, across, in the league, just you know being able to win 9 out of 10 games like they once were able to. I want to say, okay, my realistic per- prediction is the Chiefs will win. I want the football team to win. I think they can win. Because I don't want the Chiefs to win. But realistically, I'm going to pick the Chiefs. But I'm rooting for the football team. Packers visit the Bears for one of the oldest. I think it is the oldest rivalry in the NFL. Green Bay visiting Chicago. Bears, Justin Fields, looking solid. They're 3-2 and two now. They started off cold, but now they're 3-2. and two, So they're kind of back in it. This would be a massive win for the Bears. Because they'll go to 4-2. and two. The Packers will go to 4-2. and two. This is going to be a really big game. For the NFC North picture, obviously it's kind of between those two teams at this point. But I mean, 
I don't know. Vikings win. They'll move to 3-3, three and three, and now that picture looks a little bit tougher. Oh, man, this one's tough. I mean, I think the Packers will win, but I don't really want them to win because I'm a big Justin Fields fan. But if the Bears are going to win, Fields is going to have to exploit that defense. He's going to have to take advantage with his legs, and the Bears are going to have to play really good defense against that explosive offense for Green Bay. This one's kind of a toss-up. I'm leaning towards Green Bay in terms of reality, but I want the Bears to win this game. I won't be surprised if the Bears win this game, but I will be picking Packers in this game. Bengals visit the Detroit Lions. I Bengals were so close to winning last week. I told you that Bengals-Packers game was going to be a really good game to watch, and it was. All those damn field goals being missed, put that aside, but even include those if you want. It was a great game. I think the Bengals will win. I think the Bengals lost last week. Could have been a good eye opener. Be like, hey, this is a good team. This is a potential Super Bowl team. And we were two kick, missed kicks away from winning. Granted, they were three missed kicks away themselves from losing. But still, I'm going to be picking the Bengals here. I think the Bengals have a lot of good potential on this team, specifically the offense side of the ball, defense. Little little lackluster. I feel like if we were in 2022 talking about the Bengals, I think they'd be a really prominent team to kind of reckon with. Overall, I think the Bengals are just a year too early. So kind of week 10, week 12, they might fizzle out a little bit because like I said, they are a year too early in my opinion. But right now going against the Lions, this should be an easy dub for them moving to four and two. Cardinals visiting the Browns. I kind of alluded to this a little earlier. Cardinals are still undefeated, the only undefeated team in the National Football League going against the 4-2, and 3-2 and two Browns, excuse me. I don't know why I said 4-2. and two. The 3-2 and two Browns, Browns need to win this game in order to keep up with the Ravens, in order to keep up with the Bengals, who are, I'm predicting and expecting to beat the Lions. Cardinals making a statement here if they can go 6-0, and oh, winning against a really good Browns team on the road. Oh, man. I think the Cardinals will win. I don't really want either any of them to win because, you know, I'm very neutral here. I think the Cardinals will win. I won't be surprised if the Browns win, but I'm going to be picking the Arizona Cardinals here. Cowboys visiting the Patriots. I do need to talk about the Patriots and this Cowboys matchup a little bit more in depth soon. Ugh, this is tough, man. This is really tough. Patriots can win this game. They can win this game. It's going to take a total team effort. Offense is going to have to look crisp. They're going to have to look good. The pass is going to have to be quick and clean. Defense is going to have to be near perfect, stopping just about everything. I want to go Patriots. I can, Like I said, I can see them win this game. I can see them winning this game. I think they can win this game. Do I think they will? No. But I'm still going to pick the Patriots. I'm, I'm holding my bias aside. I really am. Looking at from a league perspective, if the Patriots want to be taken seriously, if they want to get back into the AFC picture, they need to make a statement win and win this game. After getting a little bit of juice and momentum last week, I think they can do it this week. I won't be surprised if they lose, though. So I will be picking Patriots. I'm not comfortable with it, but I think they can do it. Raiders visiting the Broncos. That is going to be an interesting matchup that at the beginning of the year, if you told me that, I would be like, are you smoking something? The first game in the John Gruden-less era for the Las Vegas Raiders visiting the 3-2 Denver Broncos as the Raiders are also 3-2. I think that's going to be a sneaky good game. Raiders now have something to prove with their uh, coach fired, no longer in the picture. Broncos took a tough loss last week, right? Did they lose last week? Broncos lose last week. Broncos did lose to the Steelers last week, so they have something to prove. They got to make a name for themselves again, see if they can bounce back against a good Raiders team. In all due respect, the Raiders also lost to the Bears last week. So both teams have a little bit of juice that they're fighting for this week. Good game. I like the Raiders a little bit. I think that defense is just uh, better. Offensive-wise, they have better weapons, the Raiders. That's why I'm really surprised with how good the Broncos have been doing through five weeks. I'm going to give this one to the Raiders. I think they should win. They should win, and they will win. But I am expecting a sneaky good game where the Broncos make it interesting. Sunday night football, we have the Russell Wilson-less Seahawks going against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Beginning of the year, this looked like a great matchup. Now it looks like a terrible matchup. No Wilson. Big Ben blows. No Juju. 
I could really care less who wins. Just let the Seahawks win. So my friend Justin Laco, who's a diehard Steelers fan for some odd reason, can just feel really bad about picking this. Gee, I don't know if the microphone picked that up. But some truck outside just honked and it was obnoxious. Anyways, probably not, but let the Seahawks win in Pittsburgh without Russell Wilson. Give Geno Smith the respect he deserves in this league. Just kidding. I did like him coming out of Virginia Virginia Tech, I believe. I did like him coming out of college, and the Jets picked him up. And I'm like, ah, shit, I don't like him anymore. <laughs> but, yes, Seahawks, if they want to stay competitive, they're 2-3. and three. Steelers are 2-3. and three. Both teams need to win this game. Pittsburgh should win this game. But I think it would be a sneaky win for the Seahawks. We'll just have to wait and see. Like I said, beginning of this year, this game had a lot of uh, interesting topics and a lot of interesting headlines. Now it kind of just sucks. Monday Night Football, we have the Bills visiting the Titans. Back-to-back primetime games for the Bills on the road. Got to hydrate. Bills visiting the Titans Monday Night Football. Listen, they just beat the Chiefs last week. They're 4-1 and one this year currently. Titans need to win two. They're 3-2. and two. If the Titans... I'm sorry. If the Bills want to separate themselves from the rest of the AFC, they need to win this game. And they could win this game. If the Titans want to be like, hold on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Then they need to win this game. Because the Bills are 4-1. and one. The Chargers are 4-1. and one. The Ravens are 4-1. and one. The Titans are 3-2. and two. Those are your current division leaders across the AFC. Bills, they can move to 5-1. and one. They want to make a statement and be like, hey, we just knocked the Chiefs off. We're now the AFC team to beat. Then they got to stay ahead of the Chargers, like I said, the Ravens as well, who are both 4-1, and one, and then peg the Titans to 3-3 three and three to kind of push them down and away. So I'm going to be picking the Bills here. I think it's going to be a really good game to watch. You got to watch for those, you know, you got to watch what the Titans are able to do, how they're able to match up against the Bills and see if those Titans can prove that like, hey, we're still like the AFC South, you know, champ, defending champions or whatever. Like this ain't the Bills conference just yet. Like, hold on. So I'm picking the Bills to win this game and I don't think they'll win easily. I mean, it could be a close game early on. It could be a close game down to the wire, which I'm hoping for and expecting. But if this game is a runaway, I will be a little bit surprised in all honesty. So those are my predictions. Let me just run through them really quick. I have the Dolphins over the Jaguars in London, the Panthers beating the Vikings at home, the Chargers beating the Ravens in Baltimore, Rams beating the Giants in the Meadowlands, Texans beating the – did I say Texans or the Colts before? I, oh, I think I said the Colts. I said the Colts over the Texans in Indy, the Chiefs beating the football team in D.C., the Packers beating the Bears in Chi-Town, Bengals defeating the Lions in Motor City, Cardinals beating the Browns in a good game, which I am very expected. I cannot wait to watch. Patriots over the Cowboys. Patriots over the Cowboys. Raiders defeating the Broncos in Denver. Seahawks defeating the Steelers in Pittsburgh on Sunday night. And then the Bills, D, I don't want to say dethroning, but beating the Titans in, what was the nickname for Tennessee? Rock, what is what is Tennessee's nickname? Tennessee's nickname. Um, it's not the Volunteer State. No, I need that. Um, oh Nashville, Nashville's. I need Nashville's nickname. Oh, the Music City. Thank you, Music City. Um, Bills defeating the Titans in Music City in Nashville, Tennessee. Those are my predictions across the league. And like I mentioned. Previously, I do want to talk about the Cowboys visiting the Patriots matchup. I already mentioned the Patriots could win. They need to play crisp, clean, perfect offense. That defense needs to shut everything down. It's a tough task. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. They can do it. Here are my keys to the game. Here are my keys. The Patriots passing game is going to have to catch fire. Like, Mac Jones will probably have to throw 300 yards because that running game has been lackluster these first five weeks. This isn't a game where he can be like, oh, let's get the running game going. Let's, you know, spend a couple series trying to run the ball. Like, you can't do that. you got to start off hot. you got to come out jumping. Run it on first down, fine. But second and anything more than five, you got to pass. 
I just that offense is going to have so much pressure. Trayvon Diggs has like 32 interceptions in just five games, something ridiculous. So try to stay away from him. I wouldn't really test him. I would not test him. But listen, if you can just get some crossing routes, take advantage of, you know, outside the numbers. The Patriots offense, the passing is going to have to be hot. It's going to have to be blazing. It's going to Mac Jones going to throw for 300 yards. Couple touchdowns, flawless, no interceptions, no fumbles by the running game when they do run the ball. That's how they're going to have to beat the the Cowboys. Also, defense, my second point, defense is going to have to step up. They have to, plain and simple. Defense is going to have to stop um, Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb, Ezekiel Elliott, Tony Pollard. Dak Prescott can run a little bit. Dalton Schultz, the tight end. You're going to have to play shutdown defense. Yeah, you're going to give up yards. You'll probably give up points, whether it's touchdowns or field goals. Bend, don't break. They march down, they're in the red zone. Bend, don't break, force a field goal. Three points is a lot better than six. That turns into seven. Win that way. That would be, you know, I'm a big fan of the bend, don't break mentality. Obviously, you don't want to be in a position to bend, period. But when you're going against a 4-1 and one Cowboys team that's very good, very hot, a lot of weapons and such, you kind of have to have that. You kind of have to have that mentality, excuse me. Because otherwise, I, you cannot keep up with this team. You will not win this game 42 to 38. You will not win this game 42 to 38. But if you can force them to kick threes after threes, get a stop, three, so on, I think you have a good chance of winning the game that way. Granted, your offense being able to perform themselves. So defense. Going to have to shut down Cooper. Going to have to shut down CeeDee Lamb. Obviously, Ezekiel Elliott's going to be a problem as well. Dalton Schultz has come on the past couple of games. And like I already mentioned, Dak is a great ball thrower. And he can also move in the pocket and scramble for some yards as well. So having a spy is going to be very crucial. Defense has to bend and don't break. And has to slow down this Cowboys offense. That is my second point. My third and final point for this game. It's just, just don't get blown out. Like, come on. Like, I want this game to be close. I want this game to be good. Don't get blown out. Obviously, I want the Patriots to win. That was my, that was my point last week. Was my third and final point. It's like win the game. And I thought about doing that again this week, but I was like, listen, this game is a much higher percent chance of losing than it was last week. So if you are going to lose, which a lot of people are picking the Cowboys to win, the odds are in the favor of the Cowboys. They're a better team. Their offense is better. Their defense, eh, maybe overall better. Just don't get torched. Don't just, don't lose 31 to six. Okay. Make it a close game. Keep yourself in a position to win. Put yourself in a winning position constantly and you'll be okay. Like if you go down 17 to three early in the game, you're down two possessions, which isn't the end of the world, but doesn't look good. If you're down 21 to nothing, well, now we got a problem. Now you're down three possessions, and things just do not look good at all. So keep the game close. Don't get blown out. Put the team in a winning position. Stay in winning positions. And just capitalize on any given moment to help solidify and further concrete that winning position, that game-winning mentality and such like that. So those are my three points about these uh, about the Patriots. I almost said Celtics. I low-key almost said Celtics. I don't know why. Because I don't have anything to talk about the Celtics. I don't even have them on my computer. Ew, geez. Sometimes I just talk too fast. Things slip. I mean, I've done this so many times. I'll be talking about the Patriots. And I'm like, oh, Bruins. Oh, wait. No, Patriots. Red Sox. Da, da, da. Red Sox. Red Sox. Celtics. I, I meant the Red Sox. It just happens all the damn time. But yes. Three points for the Patriots. Offense, Chris Clean, Mac Jones got through 300 yards, no turnovers, no fumbles, no picks. Defense really has to slow down that Cowboys offense. They need to step up in the secondary. They need to slow Ezekiel Elliott down, and they need to slow Dak Prescott down, force him to make mistakes. Third one, keep the game close. Keep yourself in a winning position. Keep yourself in game-winning spots. Those are my three points for the New England Patriots matchup against the Dallas Cowboys here in Week 6 at Foxborough at Gillette Stadium. In Foxborough at Gillette Stadium, excuse me. I cannot wait. That is going to be all I have to talk about football. 
let's move on to the Red Sox and their American League Championship Series matchup between between your Boston Red Sox and the scandalous Houston Astros. Yeah, I'm still I'm still petty about that. Listen, I was driving in to the shop to record this podcast, like I always do every Monday and Friday, but today's Friday. And they're talking about Chris Sale being the game one starter. Now, personally, I might have gone Evaldi, but how they were talking about it, I like going Chris Sale first. Chris Sale is a much bigger question mark than Evaldi is right now. So if you do have to pull Chris Sale early, you will be able to have all your bullpen weapons available. Instead of having Evaldi go game one, he goes six. You got to spend some guys in game one. And then Chris Sale gets pulled early game two. Now you got to kind of have to micromanage the bullpen a little bit more. While in game one, if you have to pull Chris Sale early, you have everybody available with the exception of Evaldi and probably Erod. Because I believe Erod was announced game three starter as well. So game one is Sale, two Evaldi, three is Erod. Everyone else is available. I don't see Cora going Erod in the, from the bullpen at all, to be honest. Anyways, anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. They were talking about how Chris Sale hasn't had good playoff luck, you know, as a starter at least. You know, he came out of the bullpen a few times during the World Series against the Dodgers. Pitched fairly well. It's fairly easy to pitch, you know, one, two innings than it is, you know, going for a whole start. But they were saying, when the Red Sox play the Astros in the 2017 American League Divisional Series, Chris Sale started Game 1. I don't know. I forget how many innings he went. Two, probably. Three innings. Most, I would assume. Gave up seven runs. Looked terrible. Red Sox got swept that. Yo, did they win one game? I don't remember if they got swept or they won one game in 2017. But it wasn't pretty. Didn't look good at all. But what was in 2017? The Astros cheating scandal. So they, on the radio, they posed the question, if the Astros weren't cheating, would Chris Sale have actually given up seven runs? Because the team, the, the hitters for the Astros knew when a fastball was coming, when an off speed was coming. So it's a lot easier to time up. Bang, bang. Okay, here comes a fastball. You know, let's cock it back. Or you don't hear anything, so you don't swing because it's an off speed. And I'm thinking to myself, Maybe, maybe, because I mean, Chris Sale in 2017, dominant pitcher, and he has been for the past couple of years, obviously coming back from Tommy John's a little bit d- different. But if the Astros weren't cheating in 2017, there's so many questions, right? Would the Red Sox have lost the American League Divisional Series if the Astros weren't cheating? Would the Yankees have lost the American League Championship Series if the Astros weren't cheating? Would the Astros have won the World Series against the Dodgers if the Astros weren't cheating? We don't know. That's why, in my opinion, there's a giant asterisk next to the 2017 World Series champion, Houston Astros, because, yes, they won, but they also cheated. And there's no way for us to prove that the Dodgers would have beat them, the Yankees would have beat them, or the uh, the Red Sox would have beat them during the Astros 2017 title run. There's no way to prove that. So we just kind of have to say that they won, but like, hey, let's recognize that they cheated, they proved to be cheaters, and the players didn't get no suspensions or any fines or anything like that. But AJ AJ Hinch, the Astros manager at the time, and then obviously Alex Cora, the bench coach at the time, both got full year suspensions. Anyways, would Chris Sale have given up seven runs to the Astros in that game? Who knows? Tough to tell. So do we throw that start out the window and look at Chris Sale's playoff career from his other pitching performances? Outside of that one game? Yes and no, right? I mean, keeping things fair, you would want to throw it out because that game, or I should say that entire postseason, was a fraud. But then again, you got to think to yourself, there's no way to prove that he wouldn't have given up seven runs. He may have only given up five runs, and the Red Sox still would have lost that game. So it's a tough Tough coin to flip. It's a double-edged sword. I'm going to consider that game still because it's what we have to work with. 
And with Chris Sale's playoff track record, starting-wise, I should say, all not that great. You know, he just got torched recently by the Tampa Bay Rays in Game 2. Red Sox are still miraculously able to come back and win that game. But with Chris Sale going Game 1, he's your $30 million a year, your 5-year, $150 million pitcher. He should be starting Game 1. There should be no question. We should have zero doubts. We want that man to have the ball in Game 1 of every single series. And we want him to have the ball at Game 7 of every single series. Or Game 5 if it's a divisional. Same way Yankees, feel, Yankees fans feel about Garrett Cole. We want Cole to have the ball in that wild card game because he is a 200 and something million dollar pitcher. He is going to be our ace for the next however many years are left on his contract. He is quote unquote the best pitcher in baseball. We want him on the mound. And then he gets shelled. Similar thing, Red Sox. Chris Sale is our ace. He's our starter. He's here for the next X amount of years. We gave him this big contract. He needs the ball. Hopefully he doesn't get shelled. Got shelled in game two. Hopefully it doesn't happen here in game one against Houston. Down in Houston. Down in Houston. But Chris Sale. Is he on a track record similar to David Price when Price pitched in the 2018 playoff run for the Sox? Mediocre throughout the season. Had his good starts. Had his bad starts. Got a lot of rep or bad rep from the media and Boston fans. Oh, get this bum out of here. He can't pitch in the postseason. Um, when he was here in 2017, he got shelled too. When Price was here in 2016, right? We had him in 2016. I want to say we did. Um, David Price. I want to say he was our ace in 2016. Then we signed Chris Sale. Okay, yeah, we had Price in 2016. Yeah, so I was right. And um, And then Price ended up playing very well. He pitched phenomenally. In you know the American League Championship Series, in the World Series, whether he was starting or coming out of the bullpen, it just clicked and worked. Now, Price wasn't coming off Tommy John surgery. He wasn't coming back from this major injury. He just was struggling. Pedroia was with the team at the time. He's like, hey, I'm noticing something. And then the pitching coach, and then they work, and they figure it out. This time around with Sale, Evaldi, and the pitching coach, David Bush, Working on some things. Hopefully, Chris Sale looks more like that Cy Young contender, that back-to-back American League All-Star starter, and then just that dynamic pitcher because we need him. If we go down 0-1 here in Houston, it's going to be a difficult battle to come back from. I will say, as long as the Red Sox can split this series, these first two games of the series in Houston, go 1-1, steal home field advantage, you'll be in a lot better position. Very similar to the Tampa Bay Rays series. First two on the road. Just win one and we'll be in an okay spot. Same here. Just win one. Bring it back to Fenway for the next three games. Not going to say you can win all three games. But at least you have home field for those next three games where you can maybe go up, you know, 2-1 and then 3-1, 3-2. We're just going to have to wait and see. Do I think the Red Sox can win this series? Yes. I do. I really, really do. I think that this team has really kind of banded together. They're, you know, proving all the haters, all the doubters wrong, including myself. I went weeks not talking about the Red Sox. I thought the trade deadlines were terrible. It turns out to be really good moves. Do I think another move could have been made? Yes, but I digress. Red Sox were a World Series favorite at one point, 100 win team, projected. Then they plummeted out of the playoffs and bounced back, beat the Yankees, beat the American League's best Tampa Bay Rays in four. I like what the Red Sox are doing. They have a ton of momentum. They're underdogs. And the Astros, their pitching has been so lackluster compared to recent years. McCullers might not even be on the roster because of a forearm injury. Greinke doesn't look nearly as good as he once did. Verlander has been out for the season. That bullpen is super shaky. It is not as good and uh, consistent and like electric as it once have. Even going back to the 2018 um, run, they were really good back then. 2019, good as well. So there's a lot of holes in that Astros pitching staff that the Red Sox can take advantage of. The lineup for the Astros, 
They don't have George Springer anymore, but that lineup is still really good. Altuve, Carrera, Bregman, Gurriel, Brantley. They have a ton of good guys. Alvarez, Tucker. They have a bunch of hitters. So the way that you're going to beat the Astros is take advantage of their lackluster pitching and shut down the Astros' bats. Those are the only two ways. you got to play good defense. you got to hit the ball yourself. Yada, yada. There's other things too. But those are the two main things. Take advantage of of the Astros' poor pitching and shut the Astros' bats down. Kind of simple, maybe cliche, but those are my keys to the Red Sox winning this series. Now, my prediction for this series for the Red Sox is I think it'll go six or seven games. I don't think it'll be a four-game sweep. I don't think it'll be you know five-game series. I think it'll be a six or seven-game series, one way or the other. If the Red Sox can win... One of these games would be fantastic if they could win both. But if they can win one of these games in Houston, I could see the Red Sox winning in six. I can. If they're not able to win one of these games in Houston, then it'd probably be the Astros in five or six. My official prediction for this series is Red Sox over the Astros in seven games. Like I said, six or seven games. I'm going to go seven. Who doesn't love a Game 7 in sports, right? Stanley Cups, NBA Finals, World Series, American League Championship, whatever it may be. Whatever round it is, you don't care. It's Game 7. Although I think the Red Sox can win this series, I will not be surprised if they don't. I will not be surprised if the, if the Astros win, whether it's in 5, whether it's in 6, 7, doesn't matter. I can see the Astros winning. They easily could win this series, but I don't think they easily can. I don't think it'll be an easy matchup for either team, Red Sox or Astros. And I'm expecting a fantastic series, regardless of the, the victor of this series, advancing to the World Series. I want the Red Sox, obviously, because I'm a Red Sox fan. I think they have a lot of good things going for them. They have a lot of momentum right now. Astros have some momentum too, but they also have some flaws. Red Sox, in their own respect, also have their own flaws. But I want to hear about your thoughts, your opinions, your comments, your opinions about this Red Sox-Astros American League Championship Series right now. Whether it's on social media, at Murph's Card Town, or down in the YouTube comments below if you're watching this on YouTube. Whether it's about the American League Championship Series between the Red Sox and the Astros, whether it's between the Patriots and Cowboys game here on Sunday, or any game that we talked about on Sunday, and I guess also on Monday. And then like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I want to hear thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, whatever it may be about the Charlie McAvoy signing, re-signing contract extension as well. We talked a bunch, we talked about a bunch of stuff in this episode. We really did. Like I said, Bruins, Patriots, football, Red Sox. I cannot wait to come back here on Monday and hopefully have good news in regards to the Bruins, the Bruins um, opening night in regards to the Red Sox first two games of the series because they'll be off on Monday. Hopefully the Patriots winning against the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Monday is going to be either a very happy, joyous episode where I'm going to come in here with a shit ton of energy or I'm just going to be like, oh, guys, we're going to lose this series. Mac Jones sucks. Ugh. Okay, it, it could go either way. And I'm excited for either one because it is a great time to be a Boston sports fan right now. I want to hear your thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, anything about anything we talked about in today's episode. Reach out to me at social media at Murph's Car Town or down in the YouTube comments below. And if you are watching on YouTube, please make sure you do leave a comment. Like the video if you enjoyed today's episode. Episode number, was it 96? I don't even think I said at the beginning of the episode what number. Yeah, 96. Holy smokes. And then also, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already or if you haven't considered subscribing yet i would great greatly appreciate your love and your support and if you're listening to audio only platforms spotify stitcher apple podcast google amazon what was that noise that i upstairs i don't know definitely reach out to me on social media give me a follow on twitter on facebook and also follow the shop's facebook page murph's car town and sports shop that is going to do it for today's episode that's all i have and I cannot wait to come back into the studio, into this chair, and talk to you on Monday about whatever transpires over the weekend here for the Red Sox, Bruins, and, of course, your New England Patriots. 
But that is going to do it for today's episode. Oh, it was a great episode. It was. I'm full of electricity right now. The first ever box break here at Murph's Car Town Sports Shop is going down tonight at 8 o'clock. Check out the stream. I'll be streaming it on YouTube. I'm going to make more announcements about it on social media. All the teams are full. Every single team has been claimed, which is beyond exciting. I am so excited that I don't have to auction off any teams. The shop doesn't have to claim any of the teams. I am so thrilled. But yes, that is going to do it for today's episode. And between now and the next one on Monday for episode number 97, I'll catch you later. But between now and then, you guys know that I love you. And you know that I will always, always, always see you. <laughs>